Right. Brilliant. Great. Okay. Okay, over to you, James. Okay, hello. Um, I'm James. I, I, I'm a mathematician. I'm currently a second year undergrad in mathematics, but that's kind of not the big thing that you should really focus on. I am a mathematical communicator. So my job is to go around the country, albeit virtual at the moment, and I, I talk about maths to people. And one of my kind of big interests at the moment is kind of logic and proof. So I'm going to talk today um, to you about kind of logic and proof and kind of what is a proof and the basis of mathematics. And I've prepared a few slides and I've got a demo. And we're going to look at the lean interactive the theorem prover along with kind of the, the kind of basics of mathematics. So I'm sorry if you, as Turek said, if you are a, um, a mathematician or you kind of you know a bit of maths, the things I may be going through may kind of seem very simple to you or uh, as, as mathematicians say trivial, but we are going to go through them because they, they lay very nicely into what a proof is and how we kind of we deal with proofs in mathematics. So very firstly, I'm gonna just chuck my slides in the chat uh, because maybe somebody will disconnect or kind of you want to look at the slides as we go along. So, and then I shall share my screen, bear with me, that one, okay. So let's share that. Okay, brilliant. So yes, as I said, I'm James. Uh, some of you may have taught me in, taught me, or some of you may have been taught by me, uh, which is very amusing. I'm in a brilliant time of life where I am kind of I can jump around and do lots of maths, and I've been working for the past two years on lean and interactive theorem proving, which I'll explain what all these things are. Uh, so let's just get started. So firstly. I want you to imagine a wall. So you've got in your, in your mind now, you've got a wall. So, oops, here we are, oh, the introduction. We're gonna imagine a wall. And this wall is very sturdy. It's an extremely sturdy wall. It's got lots of bricks and you've got mortar between them and kind of, it's sturdy. It's, it's well built, it's built by a good bricklayer and you can't kind of push it over it kind of it may be one at your local shop. It, it's been there for years and it won't go anywhere. But what if there was a hole in this wall? So let's think of a hole in the wall. And now we've got this hole in the wall. We're just going to kind of just, it's only a small hole. So let's just build more on top. Let's just put more and more bricks, just build bricks on top. And it's slightly less solid. And if we build more bricks on top, we're going to have a problem because that wall is slightly less solid and with lots of bricks on top, it's going to fall and crack. And now our wall has collapsed because it had a hole in it and that hole had structural problems and the wall didn't work anymore. I'm not really here to talk about walls, but stick with the analogy. So if this was really a wall, we could just mend it. We could fill in the bricks and fill in the hole and then we'd have a very sturdy wall. But this isn't any old wall. This is my imaginary wall. And this wall has a problem. This wall, where there aren't bricks or there are holes, that hole looks like the rest of the wall. You can't tell it's a hole. Their missing bricks look like normal bricks, just they don't hold weight. And you can't find which bricks you want to replace, which is a slight annoyance. So the answer to this wall falling over conundrum is not kind of curing it by putting more bricks in. It's making sure that the bricks you put into the wall are good bricks and they will hold weight. So yeah, again, we're not really talking about walls here. I'm a mathematician. I care little, I'm not a bricklayer. I care little about what the bricks are and kind of walls. I'm talking about the structure of academic maths. And it's, it's, an, it's a nice way to talk about a very obtuse subject. So here's a bit of data from 1996 to 2019, there were 215,000 papers written in the UK on the whole of mathematics. So that's pure applied, any type of maths you can think of, anything that was cutting edge that people thought was worth writing about, they wrote about it. And there were 215,000 different kind of published properly uh, peer-reviewed papers. And that's a lot. And there's a slight problem when you've got that amount of things coming out. The problem comes that people make errors. It's a, it's a part of human nature. 
everybody will make an error at some point. And you can't blame the mathematicians writing the papers for the errors. It's not something you can do. So what can you do to kind of stop the errors? Well, what you can do is prevent things, prevent the errors. Same with our wall. We, the, it was prevention, not cure. So what is this prevention? This prevention is formalization. And the, the formalization requires an interactive theorem prover, which I'm going to just refer to as lean from now on, because there are other interactive theorem provers out there. There's, um, there's Agda, there's Isabel, they're all similar things. They do kind of very similar things. And formalization is a general term and it requires a couple of steps. So the steps are taking the brick out of the wall. So we're going back to walls because walls are nicer than proofs. And we can break this wall down into its constituent parts. We can look at the mortar, we can look at the clay or the aggregate it's made of, look at what it's built on. And then we can kind of try and rebuild that brick from the stuff we brought out of the brick we brought out of the wall. So try and rebuild the bricks with the mortar and the clay. And if that brick is fine, then we can just put it back in. Otherwise, we can deal with it. So we can kind of make sure we know how to build a brick or we can find where the fault in the brick was and correct it. OK, so I probably should have mentioned at the start, any questions, by all means, either shout out, stop me. I'm, I'm being very informal with this. I'm just here to talk about maths and hopefully you'll enjoy it. So chat, put it in the chat, shout out at me at any point. If you've got the question, just ask me things. <laughs> so, OK, mathematics is a weird and wonderful beast, but I want to stress the fact that mathematics is not what you saw at school. At school, you were sat in front of a whiteboard or a blackboard, and you would have a math teacher who would say, now do these sums. You shall do 1,000 of these sums that are basically all the same. And if you can't do them, then you can't do maths. And that is not true. That, that's not what maths is. Maths is a lot more kind of nuanced and kind of beautiful than that. Maths is about proving things or kind of looking at patterns. It's, it's, it's a science of patterns, really. So I a lot of my work in analysis is looking at functions or something like sine or cosine and looking at what these functions do and kind of looking at periodicity and kind of what pretty things do functions do. And that is not sums. That, that's completely different. And when I kind of find something or when I kind of come up with some sort of uh, new result or some sort of interesting thing that I want to tell people about, I have to put them into some formal language. And the formal lang language of mathematics is made up of kind of different structures that I'm going to call them. So these structures are basically our mortar, clay or aggregate that we make bricks out of. So they are lemmas, theorems, and proofs. There are more there, there are corollaries or kind of propositions, but we don't have to worry about the rest of them. We'll focus on these three because basically all the rest are different versions of these three. So we have lemmas. Lemmas are smaller, but important results. They're less important. So there's things like Zorn's lemma, which I'm aware nobody would have heard of, but Zorn's lemma is basically if I have a set or kind of a collection, I have a collection of things. Uh, Zorn's lemma says that if I can have some sort of ordering, so if I have a box of sweets and some sweets are smaller, some sweets are bigger, it's so like a box of celebrations. And I can, I can pick out the smaller celebrations and say, okay, here's a small celebration. And I can pick out a big celebration. So something like a, I think I have Mars, they have Mars in celebrations I, I can't remember yeah, and then you have like big galaxy big chunks of galaxy they're big galaxy like the caramel ones and they have a certain ordering there's an ordering of size and if you have that ordering Zorn's lemma says that there must be a big thing in there there must be the biggest chunk of galaxy in there and it, all it says is this you'll find a lot about mass is you're not talking about um you're talking very much about existence rather than I've got this thing, it's this. It's more, it exists, not this is the thing that is the biggest. 
because when you say something is when you're specific with this is the biggest it's not that much useful use to us but some telling me that i have the biggest chocolate in this box is very useful to me as a mathematician so lemmas they're kind of smaller results maybe kind of like less important then we have theorems these are big results these are the big daddy of mass these are what you want but we have usually all the famous mathematical things that you've heard of are like theorems so we have bayes's theorem to do a statistics so that's well bayes's theorem is a special case because also that's a whole branch of mathematics but we also have things like fermat's last theorem which if you've kind of you've done any reading around mathematics you would have heard of a uh, quick brief overview of the story is Fermat, who was a French mathematician in the 16th century, I believe. He said, um, I've got a problem and I've read it in this book. And the best thing about this is the fact that uh, I've got a proof for it and it's too small for this margin. And I can't prove it here, but I've got a miraculous proof. And the problem was that a to the n equals b to the n plus c to the n. And that has no solutions for n greater than greater than two. Yeah, because if n is equal to two, you get a squared plus b squared is c squared, which is our well-known Pythagoras. But if you take the exponents to anything bigger, then you get um, uh, anything bigger then, sorry, getting distracted by the chat. Um, anything bigger, then it just doesn't work. OK, I've got a question in the chat. I'll come back to proofs in a minute, because I've got a good couple of slides about proofs. Uh, why are theorems still called theorems if they've been proved true? Ah, um, theorems, theorems and lemmas are broken down into two different things. There are two substructures into a theorem and a lemma. So you have a statement and you have a proof. So a theorem, I, I will call, I will usually refer to a theorem as um, a full statement and proof. But that's kind of, that's convention. There's kind of, it's just what mathematicians call it. But also a theorem, if a theorem hasn't been proved, usually mathematicians will call them, call it just a theorem statement. But also, I think you may be referring to the fact that we've proved that Fermat's last theorem isn't true, which may also, yeah, that we've proved that isn't true, but we still call it a theorem, which is quite counterintuitive, really, um, because it's, I, I've said that you're going to have a proof, but it's, these words are very kind of flexible, let's say. They're very, you can, they, they're basically a load of mass and then something about it, which is the proof. I'll go into what a proof is very quickly, well, in more depth in a minute. OK, so proofs are just a way, a reason why the above or a theorem or a lemma is true. So let's look more into proofs, because that's really what we're interested in. Putting a, putting a statement out there is easy. Uh, you can state anything. That's not the hard bit. It's proving everything is true. Because I can just tell you that all numbers are even. And you'll look at me and say, I don't think that's true. But that technically is still a lemma because I, I've conjectured something. Uh, so let's look at proofs. Oh, come on, there we are. proofs. OK. Our bricks in our wall are proofs and papers. So what is a proof? A proof is a string of logical deductions. Uh, it's a way of mathematically expressing yourself. Because in, in other subjects, say in kind of like science, you'll write an essay or some sort of kind of like, here's, here's my thoughts or philosophy or kind of English. You'll write an essay of all your thoughts. This is why this is true. And that doesn't quite work in mathematics because we've got the joys of heavy, bogged down notation and very kind of symbolic thinking. So we need a new way of expressing yourself. And this is what a proof basically is. A proof is a mathematician telling you how they find something is true. 
and that's all it is. People make it up to be big things, but this is just our way of expressing ourselves. Much like an artist with a painting or kind of a mus musician with an album, our, our version of that is the proof. And they are, they are as pretty as uh, an, a painting or an album, but they take a lot of appreciation sometimes. So to prove something, you must take your reader on a journey through things that you know and the reader know are true. And your final destination on this journey is a final fact that you know is true, but your reader may not. So this is your way of making sure the reader also sees the same truth as you. But you may think that's a quite nice thing. The problem is, this is a bit of a forewarning to kind of mathematics in general. Um, that this doesn't mean every proof is readable. Uh, you need a lot of mental energy to understand a proof because proofs often take you through rough and rocky roads uh, or even mountain roads. You just got the side of a mountain. Well, in, usually when I kind of put out a proof in kind of a colloquial term, I'm taking you through a nice botanical garden, a nice slow stroll on a Sunday afternoon. And someone like, um, I'm, going, I'm going to bring this out because it's right in front of me, but here's a book I'm reading at the moment by Alan Hatcher on algebraic topology, which is all about kind of like circles and how you can basically turn mathematical objects into play-doh and fiddle with them the proofs in here are unreadable at first glance it, Hatcher takes you on the mountain roads and even when Hatcher takes you on the mountain roads these mountain roads are on Everest while other books you'll look at they'll take you through the botanical gardens quite nicely so my point is here is when you look at proofs or if you do go on to do further reading on this don't expect all the mathematics to be nice because it's not. Mathematics is hard, but don't get that to put you off because the harder the proof, usually the more pretty it is because they've used some weird and wonderful kind of piece of mass that makes it short and pretty and succinct. Okay, so that's proofs and here's some actual mass. Please don't turn yourself off. This, is, this isn't hard mass. This is, this will be understandable to everybody. If you see something purple, that means that it's slightly harder than everything else but you should be able to get your head around it with me explaining it. Okay, so I'd like to quickly formally define what a number is, which seems a bit of a stupid thing to do, but a linear interactive theorem proving and proofs or formal proof is all about how you can formally define things. So I can, you can sit in front of me and tell, you, tell me, I know exactly what a number is. And a number is a thing that you count with. And unfortunately, that won't really do it. We want something more formal. So we can have different kind of types of numbers. So what we'll focus on for the time being is natural numbers. So they're the kind of the, the counting numbers. So we start at zero for obvious reason, we'll see in a minute. But we start at zero and we go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and on, all the way on. And they are naturals. And in 1889, uh, Piano said, OK, I quite like these numbers. I think I've got a nice way to define what they are. And so Piano wrote down six things. Well, Piano actually wrote more, but we're, we're going to focus on these six because I quite like them. They, can have, they nicely define what a, a number is. So first, Whitley, we're going to call zero a natural number. The reason for that is Piano just felt like it. Uh, it was just a nice starting point. Some people don't include the first, uh, the first axiom. Oh, I sure should explain what an axiom is. Um, an axiom is just something that's true. An axiom is much like an atom in kind of like science in science, in physics and chemistry. It's something that's non-divisible. We don't have to prove it. We can just say this is true, because thinking about it, when we look into maths, you can. You can take a theorem or kind of a lemma, and you can look down at all the things it uses, all the true statements that it uses in the proof of that. And eventually, as you go down, there must be some rock bottom. There must be some things that are, yes, they're just true. And axioms are those things. These are things that we can state without proof, we can just use. So the, 
there's six. Six axioms don't need proof. We can just use these to prove other things. There are foundations in our wall. So first one, as I said, zero, which is a natural number. That That's kind of debatable, but that's the most acceptable out of them. Zero is just in our numbers. And the second one is about equality, because when we talk about mathematics, I'm sure when you did math class, don't think about it too hard, because I know how I have bad experiences of math class. But still, when you were sat in that classroom, you used the equal sign a lot. Even when you're doing sums, you, you used equals. And as a mathematician, um, equals becomes more and more convoluted. But we can just say two is saying that we can use an equal sign. We can say that two things are equal if they're the same number. So one equals one, two equals two, uh, one plus two is three, uh, four out of five is nine. That, that's just what it's saying. Um, the mathematicians, if there are any mathematicians in the audience, they'll kind of that will make kind of more sense to them as the lay, into the layman, but that's fine. So then we have something called a successor. So a successor is exactly what it says in the tin. Uh, the successor is the next number. So we have n plus one, where n is just one of our numbers. So the successor of one is two. The successor of zero is one. So successor of five is six. Um, that's, that's what it is. And we'll see that's sometimes noted by suck. So suck of n is just n plus one. And we'll see that in a minute again. Then something about equality. So we're saying that if we have n equals n, n plus n must equal n plus one must equal n plus one. Again, that's fine. And then there does not exist a natural number such that n plus one is zero. So suck of n is, can't be zero. That's what it's saying. Because if we solve that equation, which is down here, then m must be negative one, which obviously we haven't defined as a, a natural number, so that can't be a thing. And last one is most important. It's called induction. Induction states that if we can prove it for n equals zero, and then by an assumption for a natural number n, we can then prove it, if we can prove it using that assumption for natural number n for n plus one, then it's true for everything. And, and that's, that's what induction is. And that may sound very obtuse, but we'll see it again in a minute. Uh, yeah, induction can start, yeah. Induction can start at n equals two. It can start wherever we want. Uh, I just state for n equals zero to keep it simple here, but you can start with any base case um, of, your, of what naturals you're considering. So there may be some place where you start with n equals one, or n equals two. You're probably seeing that in number theory where they start at n equals two because you have some recurrence relation that they're deciding that, yeah, we're just going to start at n equals two because n equals one doesn't exist. But yeah, you can start at any natural number that you want. And then for any natural number greater than that number you have for your, greater than equal to that number you have for your base case, then it's true. So yes, induction is flexible, but it's a very important tool. Anything that you prove about the natural numbers will use induction at some point. That's a very nice piece of information I only learned about a month ago, and I wish I learned it sooner. But it's, it's, a, it's a very important piece of information. OK, so let's start proving things. Let's do some proof. So let's start with a, a statement that we should all agree on. If I all get you to do in your head what 1 plus 2 is, hopefully you get 3. And what about two plus one? That also is three, hopefully. So what we can say is for any natural numbers, a plus b is the same thing as b plus a. They're equal. And we can prove this. This is a, this is a thing that's true, and it should be true. We can prove that by just letting a and b be natural numbers. And the proof is this. Uh, it's a brick. I think I've left the bricks behind at this point, but it's a brick. It's one of our bricks. This is a proof. So let's take induction on B. Uh, remember, I talked about induction in the previous slide. And you have to do induction on a variable, because if I do induction on both, that doesn't really make sense. So I'm going to choose B. It doesn't matter where I choose A or B, but I'm just going to choose B for sake of argument. Then we have a base case. This base case is going to be when A equals 0. So I'm going to plug N equals 0 into my, oh, sorry, B equals zero. Our base case for B equals zero, and I'm going to plug B equals zero into our into our equation that we're trying to prove. So then we get naught plus A is A plus naught. 
and we've got a zero add and an add zero. You'll, you'll realize why I'm calling these, these funny things in a minute. But th this is simple. We know this. Everyone should be saying, yeah, this is just this is just A equals A, which is true. This is true. So we can do that instantly. And then we have something slightly harder. So I've introduced you notation of suck of X being X plus one. So what I've said here is that we want to prove that A plus B plus one is B plus one plus A. And we can assume that A plus one is equal to B, a, B plus A. And this is just our assumptive. This is our assumptive step. This is our assumption. And this is our inductive step. So this is where uh, we've got B plus one because suck, suck of B is just going to be B plus one. So I'm going to write it out. Here we are. Here's what we want to prove. And because of the fact that uh, suck of B is just B plus one, this is really A plus B plus one, which is the same thing as suck of A plus B. And we can do the same on the right hand side. And then we know that A plus B is B plus A from our assumption, which we then rewrite. And then we get the proof. And then that, that's a proof. We proved that A plus B must equal B plus A for the fact that we've got a base case. And then we've got a uh, assumptive case. We assume for any natural number. And then we assume for, given that assumption, we can prove for natural number plus one that it's true. Because intuitively what we can do now is take our base case, because we know it's true for our base case. So we can plug zero into our, um, our assumptive step. And then as we know the assumptive step is true, then it must be true for, so we've got A equals A for B equals zero. And then now we know it's true for that. We also know it's true for uh, zero plus one. So it's true for one. And then we can do it again. OK, let's take one. And that can be our assumptive step. Then we've proved that it's true for our, our one plus one. So it's true for two. And then true for three. Then true for four. Then five and six. And that's true for all the natural numbers. This is the main thing about the naturals, is the fact that if you can do this induction process, then things are true which is very nice. And I, I think there's a link somewhere to Kevin Buzzard's natural number game, uh, which is very, very fun to play. I, I play that. I played that when I first get an interlink. Yeah, this is only using Piano's axioms. I haven't, I haven't used anything else. That's all I've used is what well, I've used. Okay, I used the fact that uh, A plus successor of B is successor of A plus B. But we kind of, we, we've proved that along the way. But yes, we've used nothing, everything here, is either derived very quickly from Piano's axioms or using Piano's axioms. So a lot of stuff can be proved. Everything in the natural number game, which is linked on the, on the um, site for this event page, that's all using Piano's. And you can get very far. You can get extremely far just with Piano's. Uh, you can do anything about natural numbers with just Piano's. OK, so this is how we do it in mass. And I don't really need you to fully understand what's going on here. I just want you to see the similarities in the next slide. OK, so here's another proof that A plus B is B plus A. There. Now, you, I know you're all data scientists, so obviously you like a bit of code. So here's a bit of code, which hopefully you'll feel more kind of at home with. So what I've got here is a lemma. I've got a lemma that's called addcom, which means additive commutativity which is, we call this A plus B is B plus A, that's commutativity. So A and B are natural numbers. And this is our statement, A plus B is B plus A. I'm going to begin the proof. That's what this means. We're going to start beginning the proof. So I'm going to do induction on B, as I did before. And we're going to give, give lean some names. This is a lean proof. So we're going to start with base case. We're going to start with induction hypothesis. These are our names for things. And I'll, I'll do this a minute when I do my demo. This will be the first thing I do in the demo. So we can rewrite with zero add and add zero, which is exactly what I called them in the previous slide. And we can rewrite add suck, and then which is our fact that A plus suck of B is suck of A plus B. And then we can have an induction hypothesis. And then we've got suck add, which is uh, the suck of B plus A is suck of A plus B, which is, and then we're done. Then that's the proof complete. But hopefully you can see that there is quite a lot of similarities between this and this. They're basically the same thing. 
that's all I wanted to show. So here's a lean proof, and we'll look at more in a little bit. But more a bit about lean, which is probably more of interest to you lot as you like your data science. Lean is entirely functional. So it has, you put things in, you get things out. That, that's, that's what it is. It's based off type theory. So you can create functions. Uh, well, you can create functions by creating what are seen as proper mathematical statements. So you're going to use uh, first order logic. This is a purple section. We're going to use first order logic in order to um, create mass. And then you can use types. And then you get mass. That's, that's basically what it is. And you provide it with these by defining mathematical objects. So I can define the sine function or the cosine function, and I can prove stuff about them. For example, that sine of 2a is 2 sine a uh, times cos a. That, that's, that's what I can prove. I can prove anything I want about them within, within well, no, there's no even within reason. Whatever I can prove, I can prove about them in lean. And technically, I'll note here for anybody who actually fiddles with lean, what I call lean and what is the mass library aren't the same thing. Lean is the functional programming language. Lean mathlib is the mass library. But I'm a mathematician, so they're the same thing for me. That lean and the mathlib are the same thing. So I should refer to as lean and mathlib as lean. Uh, so I'm sorry for any computer scientists here, but they're the same thing to me. OK, so a bit more about Lean. What has been formalized? Lean now has 500,000 lines as of two months ago of proof, definition, and statement. There are 24,000 definitions, 53,000 theorems slash lemmas, and 161 contributors, of which I am one. And so there's a high chance of what you want to be formalized can be formalized in Lean. And here's a nice little graph that kind of is kind of looking, it went kind of nicely linearly and then lockdown hit and then went exponential. <laughs> lockdown has been very good for us lean folk. We had plenty of time to sit down and just formalize. Okay, so there is work in almost every field of pure mathematics, anything you can think of, uh, analysis, algebra, geometry, that there's something there, and some fields of applied mathematics. Um, applied mathematics, I kind of find, is presented in a slightly different way. It's a lot less axiomatized than pure math is, which makes it harder to formalize. So it's highly, it's highly kind of pure math centric because it's easy to formalize, and the pure math that is in MathLib is very generalized as well. Uh, so, for example, for people who are of a more mathematical nature, uh, the sine function is not defined as we define it in school using triangles. It's defined using something called complex numbers. So the complex number is basically a, it's, it's related to the square root of negative one, which many of you will scream as I start to mention this, that like, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, you can do that. And th that's what we define complex numbers by. It's a plus b times the square root of negative one. And using them, you can define the complex sine and complex cosine. And then we just take the real versions of them as the real sine and cosine in MathLib, which annoys me to a greater extent. But that's the way it is. Everything is highly generalized. And this is to prevent code repetition, because we don't want someone to write the generalized version and then also someone to write the non-generalized version, because although it would be nice to have two, uh, we only have a certain amount of space to kind of keep our code. So that will probably make sense to a lot of you. OK, so I work in analysis, as I've said. So a couple of things I've done is I've proved stuff about the inverse hyperbolic sign, which is called rcinch, which uh, people have probably not heard of, but that's fine. But I proved that cinch r cinch x is equal to x, which seems pretty trivial. Again, which uh, lots of things that you think are simple or kind of should really make sense don't in lean for the fact you've got to be very formal. And also, it took me three months to prove that the area of a circle, a unit circle at that, a circle with radius one, it took me three months to prove that the area of a unit circle is pi. I've got another talk about that.
but yes, I proved that in three months. I shall link to the video at the end of that because I quite enjoyed that talk. Okay, so now we're at the Lean demo. We've, we've gone through all the laborious, slightly boring, James talks about mass for about, I don't know how long I've been going, but about 45 minutes. Let's actually talk about Lean at this point. So I'm gonna talk you through a few bits and bobs relating to uh, sine and cosine. I'm not gonna sit here and talk to you about the, uh, the proof of the error of a circle. I'm not that masochistic. So here's, here's a diagram. I, I've drawn a unit circle but I can draw a triangle onto that unit circle. And the radius, you can see with the hypotenuse of that triangle, or the, the long length is one. And then I can drive two functions off that, which is the sine and the cosine. So they're, they're two different functions, and we can do fun things with them. And I'm going to prove a couple of little bits about sine and cosine. And then I've got a challenge for myself to see if I can actually prove something that hasn't been proved yet but I think would be quite fun to prove. So you, you shall be sitting there this evening as I do something for the first time, which is always good fun. So hopefully I'll be able to do it, but look forward to that in approximately 15 minutes. Okay, so I'll stop sharing them. And any questions before I start the Lean demo? Feel free to just shout them out and shout at me. If not, that's fine. We can move. We can move on swiftly onto the demo. Okay, so I'm going to share that screen. Okay, so welcome. This is uh, an IDE. To those who use, who use programming languages, you shall kind of understand what I'm looking at. But for those that you don't, here is what well, it's basically a text editor. This is what I'm looking at when I'm formalizing. It's very similar to any other programming language. Uh, we have we have things we do. So Here's on the left, I've got, this is just uh, VS Code, it's nothing special. So I have the whole mass library imported in up here, and then I have my lean files. So you can see I've got one, which is called DSC, and then we have the Git and all the stuff, but we don't worry about that. Here's where I kind of I write my code. And on the right, we've got something that probably you haven't seen before. On the right, we have this thing called a lean info view. Because mass is very interactive, we need some way to get feedback from our, um, our piece of code. So I've got this lemma here called sign sub. I'll explain what it is in a minute. I'm going to move you down there because it's slightly in the way. There we are. And when I click at my begin, I've got a load of mass. And this is the way you interactively interface with lean because it tells you what it wants you to prove, which is one of the massive, big, amazing positives of Lean is the fact that you can just, it'll tell you what it wants. So it wants me to prove that sine of x minus y is sine x times cos y minus cos x times sine y. And it's brilliant. I shall come back to proving this in a minute. I'll just talk about what I've got here. So I've got an import here. This is just importing uh, from the mass library, it's just importing, oh, it's not happy with me. Lean is, is very unhappy sometimes. It's just importing the, uh, uh, the trig, trigonometric functions. That's fine. Okay, are you gonna be happy with me or are you not gonna be happy with me? Why, why are you not happy? What's your problem? Command expected, no, good, thank you. Lean's a bit slow because I'm also running a, a Zoom call. Yeah, and this just says uh, we, we're using real numbers, using the reals. So assume, just assume all functions are real. So it just makes it a bit more user friendly. And this is, yeah, let's use the, the real notation. So this is all kind of like gritty lean stuff. And what I'm saying here is okay, uh, x and y. I should write this, I should. Right, x and y are, are reals. So that's what the, this is what this symbol means. This means x and y are real. It's, it's a blackboard face font, which is very kind of regular in mathematics. It means they're real. And here's a lemma. I, I'm saying here's a lemma about sign. And here's the statement. 
That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, okay, here's sign, here's a lemma, here's the name, and here's what the statement is. And then I say, okay, here's the proof. And I've, I've said, okay, let's begin the proof here. Oops. Let's begin the proof. And then he's like, okay, here's what I want you to prove. I want you to prove that sine of x minus y is sine of x times cos of y minus cos of x times sine of y. And then I can go, okay, I kind of know what I'm doing here. I can rewrite, uh, I think it's called adneg. These are all things that they say as they struggle with what it's called. And if you have a problem with what it's called, you can always say, okay, example, hmm, I know that I want to prove that x minus y is x plus negative y. And what's this? Tell me what it is, Lean. And you can use something called library search. And it will search the library, the mass library, until it says, hmm, let me have a think. I'm going to have a think now. And it will come up in the end with what it is eventually as as it defines, okay, that's fine. We can it'll eventually come back and say, oh, I know exactly what that is. Add neck, there, no, uh, oh, is it sub neck? Is it sub neck? No, is it sub neck? Is it sub neck? Yes, no, it's not sub neck. Uh, no, it's not that one. It's one of these. Oh, I'm getting things. Uh, what are the rewrites? Yes. They are RWs. RW does mean rewrite. Um, basically, it's saying, OK, what we want to do is we want to take a lemma or a thing, and I want to rewrite it. I want it to be, I want to take this true thing. So if this ever loads, come on. No, it's not. It's probably because I've got a Zoom call running. But what I can do is I can find, um, uh, come on, which one is it? But what it does is it replaces the left-hand side of one of these equations I've got here with the right-hand side. So it should be add, add, was it sub ec? This is going well as lean, as lean is not doing what I want it to do. OK, let's move into this one. This one, this one will show it better. Because what we can now use is the rewrite sine sub. And we'll come back to that one, prove that one in a minute, as I can't type. OK, so sine sub. And what's it going to complain? There we are. So sine sub, as we defined above, says that if you give me some, uh, some real numbers, I'll replace sine of x minus y with sine of x times cos of y minus cos of x times sine of y. And what it does, rewrite does, is it takes it mats and patches. It, it pattern matches, not matten patches, pattern matches. So it takes it, it takes in the sine of uh, pi minus x and it replaces it with the sine of pi times cos of x minus cos of, cos of pi times sine of x and equaling, it'll leave the equal sine of x as it is. So it's very, very much like how you do normal mass is I'm going to do something to left and side and replace it with something else. And that's what rewrite does. And it's, it's literally called rewrite. And I can rewrite something else. I can rewrite sine pi. And I can rewrite cos pi. And then I can rewrite zero add. These are all things that are in the mass library that I just know. Uh, it's, no, it's not zero add, it's zero mul, isn't it? There, that's the multiplication gems, there. Are. And then we can go for a rewrite zero sub. There we are. And then that looks a bit yucky. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in something else. I'm gonna just use the simplifier. And simp is just literally a simplifier. Lean will go, okay, I kind of know what's going on here. All I need to do is I need to take this negative and do some math with it and then times it by another negative. And the negative on the negative is gonna be a positive. So that's gonna end up as one times sine x. And then I, that one times sine x is just gonna be a sine x. I know that as a simplifier because I can question it by putting a question mark after it, and it will give me a load of stuff. And how much of that I actually need, I think it's that one is the most important one, because I can just tell, OK, that's what Simp did, but Simp does too much sometimes. And there we are. And then I can rewrite neg neg. And then rewrite one more. 
and I can get rid of that line. And what you saw me in the examples in the slides, what I did was you can just remove all these rewrites. If you just got a string, you can just remove all the rewrites and you can do stuff like this. There we are. And you can just put that on the new line. Just move that like that. And there we are. So what I've done is I've put them all in because that's they're all rewrites. You're just rewriting one after another. I'm rewriting sine sub prime, then sine pi, cos pi, zero, mar, blah, blah, blah. So then that's the proof. That's, that's why those two are the same. OK, so then this one, you can use something else called apply. So we're going to apply this thing, which is a apply is slightly stronger than rewrite. So what you can do, ah, I've forgotten, I've re I, I go rewrite something first. So sine, uh, sine square uh, at add cos square, we rewrite that. No, is it not that one? I'm going to go over into the back end. It's one of these things. Here's a load of lean code. Welcome. Uh, it's, uh, it's the left hand side, isn't it? Uh, sine square, is it left hand? No, this is, this is how you, this is, you're getting the lean experience of, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. So I'm just going to look at the back end and work out what's going on and then rewrite write my lean code. So here we are, we're going, we're going to the left hand side. So we're going from the one to the sine squared plus cos squared. And then we can apply this lemma, which then goes from, this one has a lot of stuff, but basically it's saying that if A is less than or equal to A plus B, then zero is greater than zero. Uh, then zero is less than or equal to B, which we get. And then we can rewrite, uh, I think it's square non-neg. Is it called square non-neg? Yep. Oh, we've got, to, we've got to apply there. Apply square non-neg. And then goal complete. So apply is a more kind of like stronger way of rewriting when you've got stuff like less than equals and stuff like this, which mathematicians, this is a very moot point, but mathematicians use um, rewrite and apply in two different ways. Uh, well, they use them in one way, but actually we use them in two ways, but we don't really know what's going on in the second way. We just treat them colloquially as the same thing when really when you're doing formalism, they aren't the same thing. Okay, so here's the new thing. Here's the sign of three times X is this. This isn't really hasn't been done yet. So I decided that because I have too much, uh, too much um, belief in myself, I do it live without any sort of notes. So there's no proof for this. So either this is going to go well, or I'm going to make a fool of myself. And I'm going to have fun trying. OK, so what I've already done is I've, I've just given myself a quick head start by saying have. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a true thing. I'm letting Lee know that 2x two pl two plus x is 3x. And this is done by linear arithmetic, which is a tactic. We have two different things in Lean. We have theorems and lemmas, and we have tactics. Tactics are the more computer science end. So it's Lean working out things for itself. So it's like the simplifier. The simplifier knows things. And so through some fancy code, it can work out what, what to do. Same with linear arithmetic, linareth. So linareth can do linear arithmetic for you because of someone's fancy code. I don't understand it. A load of computer scientists roast it. And I just use it. I think it's fun. It's, it's cool. So that's true. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rewrite H. Uh, the left hand side of H. Yeah. So now I've got sine of 2x plus x is what's on my right hand side. So hopefully now I need another one of these. So I need to have H2. And I'm going to say that x plus x is 2x. And I'm not going to use this oh, two times x because this is computer science by Linareth. Uh, Linareth, Linareth, there we are. OK, so now I'm going to use is I'm going to rewrite sine add, which basically says the usual result. It says that sine of x plus y is sine of x times cos of y plus cos of x times sine of y. So now I've got a load of stuff. So 
remember earlier in the slides, they were talking about sine of 2x and cos of 2x. So hopefully what I can do is I can rewrite the left-hand side of h2. And hopefully lean is smart enough to do this. Yes, it is. It's, I can, also, the good thing about lean is I can go back and forth between my steps. And you can see you go from x plus x to 2x, x plus x to 2x. And what I can do now is I can create more of a mess by rewriting sine out again. And there we are, there's more, there's a bit of a mess and I can rewrite cos ad. There's some more of a mess. And now what I've got here is just a bit of a mess. So can I get the simplifier to do it? Will the simplifier do it? No, the simplifier will not do it. So I can try a new tactic called ring. Is ring going to do it? Can ring do it? Ring, ring can get far enough with it. So now I, I've just put it into the black box and told this is messy. This is just a load of algebra, which I could do, or I could get the computer to do it for me, which is a massive bonus of doing maths on the computer is I can just tell the computer to do it for me. So, okay, so now what I've got is sine negative sine squared plus three cos squared times by sine uh, is the same as negative four uh, times sine squared uh, plus three. Okay, so I think I kind of know what I need to do here. I need to get a three out of this somehow. So really what I want is I want to prove that because I've got a sign here and a sign here, I want to prove that this, come here, behave. I want to prove that this, let me put it into a comment to make it slightly easier to see what I want to do, is I want to do that is equal to that. And that may not seem slightly obvious, not, may not be obvious at first what I want to do mathematically, but remember that sine squared plus cos squared is one. So what I've got here is sine, negative sine squared plus three cos squared is negative sine squared plus three cos squared. Have I copied the right thing? No, I haven't. I, have, I never copied it, I was gonna say. That doesn't sound quite right. But they're the same thing. Yeah, come here. There we are. That's exactly what I want. I want that one. There. So I want to prove there. Negative sine squared plus three cos squared is negative four times sine squared plus three. Okay. So I know that three is sine squared of x plus cos squared of x. That's something that I used above. That is just the statement of uh, sine square add cos square. So what I can do is I can have use another have statement. It's called h3. That 3 equals 3 times 1. And I'm aware this is just mass at this point. I'm just doing mass. Come on. Are you not happy with me? Oh, I, I put an extra equal there. There. And that's just proof by definition. That's what ruffle means. Ruffle is proof by definition. It's it's so simple. Even lean can work it out without any any kind of prodding. So now I can rewrite the left hand side of h three. I could have made life easier with myself by putting it other way other way round. Uh, come on, did I not did I not need the left hand side? Oh, I didn't need the left hand. No, it's not happy with me anyway. What are you doing? You're not happy with me. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll use another. We'll use another thing that I know about lean is conv mode, which is a nicer way to rewrite things, which is, I, I'm kind of getting into the moot points at this point. Uh, there we are. What, what are you happy? What are you not happy about? Oh, I need to put a comma. There we are. I did say that I was going to make a fool of myself or die trying. So you're going to let me in? There we are. So uh, I need right-hand side. Okay, so now we can hopefully rewrite H3. No, it still doesn't like the fact that, oh, is it not treating what's, ah, am I in the wrong type? So what's the type of that? That's the real. It's probably assumed that this is the three, 
of naturals because that's what lean defaults to. Can I do that now? As it complains. Uh, uh, now it doesn't like it, so that's fine because reals are non-computable. That's fine. And hopefully that, yeah, no, it works. That's fine. I had, I had a type error. I was trying to rewrite the three of the naturals with the three of the reals, which isn't the same in lean. And another mute, there's lots of mute points with lean. Okay. So now, hopefully I can rewrite the left-hand side of sine square, uh, add cos square. There we are. Hopefully do that. Yeah, no, yep, yeah. and now simp. It's, it's output a load of confusing stuff. So hopefully now I can simplify. No, that's not what I wanted. That's fine. We're heading towards making a fool of myself. Uh, come on. As, as lean, lean is a very sm slow language. It's, it's one of the big things that you're probably noticing that I'm spending most of my time getting very, yes, I'm aware, but I'm trying to rewrite the, the three times one. That's why I've, I've rewritten three as three times one. So I want that to be converted into a sine squared plus cos squared, which is, it's complaining because there's one now, there's now ones everywhere. Hmm. Uh, let's go back into conv because that'll make it easier. But the thing that one is um, is a, uh, is the same issue with um, numbers and reals with one as well. Uh, it shouldn't be because okay. the sine and cosine are real numbers. Okay. So I think at this point it's pretty simple. So it shouldn't be that bad. Um, I just need to rewrite it, and I may be losing people, but. Any more questions before I finish off? I think there's a comment from Vasu in, in the in the chat. Oh, is that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed, agreed. Yeah, I'm trying to rewrite this three over here as um, this instead of the three, three times one, that one being sine squared plus cos squared. And it's just misbehaving and my computer is very slow. Not to worry. Um, that's the dangers of uh, of, of uh, live coding. That Computing. these things happen. It just things yeah, happen. It's, it's, things misbehave. Things you. happen. No, but um, but I think um, I have certainly a few general questions. Um, yeah, but means uh, if, if if you've come to the end of the, your planned yeah. kind of presentation, um, so thanks uh, for the for the kind of introduction to uh, what mathematics really is, and it's not about um, doing mental arithmetic. You know, <laughs> well, it's certainly not just about that. It's a lot more than that. So. Thanks yeah. for kind of explaining that, and and for people who are interested in maths but were never kind of taught it properly, your explanation of you know what is a lemma and what's a theorem, that that was really really helpful, um, and the idea of axioms, uh, that's your kind of your starting foundations, and you can build up from there. That that, that was really really kind of uh, insightful as well, um, and I guess uh, you know there are different versions of maths with different axioms. Um, my questions really um, uh, are really around. Um, the theorem kind of provers. So the first question I've got is, inside them, are they um, trying different combinations of tactics and substitutions and, and so on to try and go from the starting point to um, what, what you want to prove? So if I start with, you know, statement A and I want to end up at statement Z. Is it like um, an engine inside, which, which some people might call a, a search tree or a search engine where it's trying different things until it finds uh, the path that does get from A to Z and you help it with your library of pre-proved um, intermediary results. Have I got that right? Have I, am I totally barking at the wrong tree? You, you're talking more about kind of like automated theorem proving. So the, the okay. amount that actually Lean does for you um, is debatable. Um, okay. The only things that Lean does is like the simp and the ring and kind of all, and Linareth. 
they are kind of, yes, they are, some of them, the way that SIMP works is that we have a load of lemmas. And yes, those lemmas, some lemmas are marked with SIMP. So if I go to, um, let me share my screen and let me share that again, uh, we can go on to exponential and you can see that this here is marked with just SIMP. And this, this, this means that SIMP has a load of lemmas that you can pull from. And then it does a binary search tree on that. Okay. So it looks, well, it's slightly smarter than the binary, binary, um, a binary search tree. It looks at what it's got in the goal, then it forms a tree and then it does a binary search. Okay. So it looks for, if, it's, if I've got a goal of sine and cosine, it'll take all the simple lemmas it knows it's got sine and cosine in and then kind of create a binary search tree on it. Okay. I think I've just had a realization, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. So I was thinking, I don't know if anyone in the mem in the audience knows about Prolog, which is a logic programming language. And with that one, you make into functional language, you, you, you make statements of fact, and you want to prove something. And what the language does is it applies deductive reasoning to get from the starting blocks to the end. Now, what I'm understanding about lean is actually, as a mathematician, you're doing that. But what the yeah. what what the interactive lean assistant does? It's an assistant. It tells you when you've when you've done it wrong. Yeah. So yeah. you're lean actually is... doing the you're yeah, actually sorry. doing the proof. It isn't doing the searching. It might do a little bit of simplifying, but it's not automatically finding proofs. You're still doing that. Yes. But it's telling you when you've done it wrong because there's an inconsistency. Have yes. I got that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, okay. I, that's the exact, it's not an automatic, if you came into here thinking that Lean was mm. going to do proofs for you, not yet. There is a research project in America that is doing that, but Lean doesn't do that currently. Uh, what Lean does is it's very useful. I use it for teach, I teach the introduction to proof or help to teach the introduction to proof at the University of Exeter. And we use this Lean, we use Lean because when the, when the students say, oh, I'm going to, use this lemma and then it doesn't work. The lean says, no, ha, no, wrong, do something else. And the student's like, oh, I, I don't do it here. Because uh, otherwise doing proof on paper and learning proof, you got me talking about learning and proofs. <laughs> but when you're learning proof, proof is a very hard skill to learn because mm. um, a good example that I have is that if I have, uh, say that 450 is dividable, divisible by nine, um, I can go one way with that statement, but I can't go the other. And so students usually try and go the wrong way with that statement and lean what allow you to do that. So they give some intuition about what's the right way with statements. Uh, okay. I forgot yeah. the question, but that, no, uh, no, no, that's really, really interesting. Yeah, lean, uh, lean is, you give stuff, you have to write the code. Yeah. You, lean doesn't write code for you. That's why I'm saying yeah. it's a functional programming language that just yeah. does mass. Yeah. Yeah. And when you said um, uh, a type system, it's a type, uh, it's based on type theory. Um, is that its fundamental units? It's you define types and it manipulates them or checks consistency with them. It checks consistency. Okay. I'm not going to yeah. go into. Oops, if sorry. I might, if I might add something to the previous discussion. Um, so lean is a rather young system of the class of interactive theory improvers. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Lean in a couple of years will catch up in terms of degree of automation with systems like Isabel. Yeah, Isabel um, is very, because they got Sledgehammer, haven't Isabel? Uh, Isabel's yeah, it's, got... not, it's not only Sledgehammer, it's also tactics like Auto and Lin Arid, which are much more powerful with, uh, uh, which what Lean has at the moment. And the important part is, those tactics, they use all types of computer science techniques for finding parts of a proof. So they do deductive reasoning like Prolog, they do everything, but the important part is while <clears throat> the details between the systems differ a little bit, Lean and Isabel and Koch, they all exploit the type system of the programming language in which they are implemented mm -hmm. to ensure that you cannot do introduce bugs in your mathematical reasoning by doing a programming error in your tactic. If you do a programming error, 
that might result in um, an intermediate proof state that, you do, that is not helpful, but it will yeah. not introduce a wrong mathematical statement. That's the important part here. Yeah, yeah. The, the lean, lean will always come out with, well, unless you do some use, in, there are some cases in lean where it, it will output something absolutely ludicrous or useless. But as useless, long as you- Yes, but not logically inconsistent, uh, assuming that the axioms you start with are logically consistent. We, well, some tactics like convert, convert or congra will output something that is use, uh, nonsensical. But yes, yet usually uh, if you're not using convert or, or congra, you will get something yeah, that not, is... Not inconsistent, so you shouldn't come up being able to prove true equals false. Uh, no, yeah, <clears throat> no, but... Th that's what I mean with consistency. Okay, yeah, yeah. Logical okay, consistency yeah. would be... Logical yeah. consistency. Not, some, the sometimes system it's mathematically inconsistent, but yes, okay. It, it is useless, it doesn't make any sense, yes. But you cannot prove a false statement. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the assurance that you get from those systems. That's the important property. Uh, okay, sorry. That's um, really, no, thank you, that's I really, mean, really helpful. Um, for somebody I'm like me who is new Isabel to it. since 20 years and impl implementing also tactics, so that's why I'm deep into the details yeah. here. Yeah. No, no, thank you very much. That, that's really, really helpful. Thank you for intervening. I didn't spot your hand was up then. Um, I'm a mathematician, so I do it on face. Everything is face value for me. It's like, oh, maths, let's do a little math. <laughs> I'm in the computing, uh, in the computer science department at the uh, university. Oh fair. oh, fair enough. Yeah. OK, fair. There's a question from um, uh, Vasu. He's saying, I am learning cock these days. Uh, I have a hard time converting my formal proofs into succinct but complete informal proofs. How should I think about it? Um, I don't know if, if, if James or anyone else on the call has got any thoughts on that. Okay. Um, I've, yeah, I, I don't know what type of maths you're doing, but I've, I've kind of, I've been doing a lot of analysis, as I've said, and I do a bit of algebra now and again. Uh, and I, I see that when you're doing algebra, algebra, everything is kind of like, it's a lot easier to convert from normal proofs to formal proofs. But if you're doing something like analysis, it depends. I don't know what cock. I don't haven't fiddled with cock, so I don't know what kind of what the library is. Um, but I know in lean, when you're talking about lean, um, you'll have to be thinking in the right generality. That's kind of the the big thing that I found is if you work in the right generality, then you shouldn't have that much of a problem. But if you're converting from, say, if we're talking about analysis, there's things called filters. So if you're jumping from epsilon deltas to filters then you're going to have a bit of a problem there. So making things, breaking down the proof into kind of small manageable chunks and then formalizing it is kind of the big thing that I think I do. Um, a, a general question for me, um, again, for, for beginners is, oh, actually, I think Vasu, um, did somebody comment that's, for Vasu? Brooker, Brooker has put something in the chat. Uh, yeah, it was just, uh, there are different languages that Koch uses, and there's a apply style one, which looks like programming, and there should be a more high level one. I don't remember the name for Koch in Isabel, it would be Isar, which makes the structure of the proofs much more visible. So you, if in Isabel, if you do an um, induction, you do proof by induction, then you get your base case, you get your induction case, um, and transferring those proofs back and forth between a mathematical pen and paper proof and a formal proof in the system is at least much easier and much closer to what uh, a mathematician would expect than the apply style one, which is, to be honest, computer science programming and is only explainable to me historically if you know how the systems looked like in the 80s and 90s when they have been invented. <laughs> that sounds like the back end of Lean. The, the front end of lean is is nice. Well, back end being all the computer science bits that, that aren't the math library, but the math library has been taken over by a load of mathematicians because I don't think I mentioned this, but um, Isabel is the University of Cambridge's project. Um, and uh, I think it is, or at least that's how, what I relate it to. And lean is Microsoft research. So there are three or four people at Microsoft research that make lean um, as a research project. and. The, the mathematicians just said, yeah, let's have it. Let's do maths in it and grabbed it and ran away with it. 
Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, for those of us who are brand new to this, um, what would you suggest as the easiest, simplest exercises um, to try and do? So if I said, if I went away myself as a complete beginner, which I am, yeah. I yeah. said, okay, uh, let me pick a really simple proof that I could try and do with, uh, with Lean. Um, would it be something like you know, the old Euclid proof of uh, infinite primes, which is was it 2000 years old, is that something that is a good thing for me to try and do in um, in, in in lean, or or actually is that it's actually um, a misconception? That's like that's going to be three hundred lines of lean code. Is it? Oh yes. right, okay. Uh, All right. Geometry, anything geometry related is going to be hard. You want okay. something that's axiomatized. So okay. things like natural numbers. I've just put Kevin's brother's natural number game into the chat. Sure. That is your best start for lean. If okay. you want to start doing stuff do that first and okay, then that's... look at axiom axiomatizable mass so uh algebra so group stuff is very easy for the fact that you've got a load of axioms and you can do stuff on them same with analysis you kind of you've got the real numbers you can do certain things with them then you can prove stuff um natural numbers dead simple you can just do induction okay. and then once you start fiddling with it so you want things that have got solid foundations okay um so when, when i mentioned euclid i know he's done a lot of geometry but the um the, the the proof that there are infinite or endless prime numbers is i think not geometric it's just um all he does is to say if i've got a bunch of prime numbers and they're finite uh, uh, yeah. then i can multiply them all and add yeah. one then it's not divisible by any of those so it must be a new prime number or the all the prime numbers that i have aren't mm -hmm. complete so it's easier for me to say that in plain English. Would that translate into a manageable project in, in uh, Lean? So there's no geometry. It it's could pure... be a first project after okay. you've um, worked through the natural number game and you understand really formally what Euclid means. That, okay. that proof, I wouldn't describe. It's a brilliant proof. I'm not discrediting it, discrediting sure. it but that's not, a, I wouldn't call it a very formal proof because right. Euclid misses out several things and when you're talking about interactive theorem provers you have to be very concrete about what you're talking about okay because because you have to have the you've got all those primes then you've got the assumption that there are finitely many primes how do you formalize that how do you write that uh, okay. in a way right. and then find multiplying them together add one then then you've got to prove that that's not a prime because yeah. in a formal way you can't just say that's ah, not a prime then you'll say oh why yeah Okay. So, yeah, no, that, that, that gives insight. I, I mean, also as a general uh, explanation, so what is behind the theory improvers is also trying to find a universal language to describe math. And mm. <clears throat> the book version of that would be, for example, um, Bertrand Russell's uh, Principia Mathematica. And yeah. the theory improvers that we have at the moment, they all are based uh, as logic, as the core language. They have different versions of it. So the closer you get to a logical proof, the more built-in support you have. So that's why trigonometry is more hard because you need more user-provided lemmas to work with it and more formalization with it because that's a concept that first need to be taught to the system. Oh, okay. And when you mentioned Bertrand Russell, um, that led me on to um, uh, the idea of incompleteness in Mr. Girdle. Does that, does that become a problem? <laughs> or or, or yeah, should we not go there today? There isn't enough mass in lean for that to be a problem yet. Uh, oh, I'm not sure about lean, but the logic that is Isabel uses Isabel, is, yeah. is undecidable, which means that's exactly the reason why you cannot have a fully automated system. And the general rule of thumb is induction, for example, is something which is very, very hard to automate because you have that creative step of finding where to apply your uh, induction hypothesis. Um, and you have infinite structures, but that's why we have the human to guide the system in those cases. And whenever you're in a frag fragment that is decidable, you have all those nice automated tools that help you. Yeah. But yes, yeah. the logic of uh, Isabel and also Koch is undecidable lean to be honest, I don't know. It's current. I think it's currently decidable. I think. 
Uh, but if it would be decidable, I mean, then you can write down a fully automated uh, proof algorithm. I think um, that's some. I think someone has done that. That's why I'm saying I think it's currently decidable. Someone's. Will We lost uh, James there. Is everyone else still on the call? No, it's me. It's me. It's me. Yeah. It's me. <laughs> okay. I'm back. Am I back? Yeah. Right, I'm back. back. Good. That's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the, the college internet um, isn't great, but yeah. Um, it's so. I'm, I was talking to someone about induction, and they're doing a uh, induction tactic, um, which does computer science induction. Uh, which I assume is makes things decidable. I would be surprised if it's if it is decidable. Oh, uh, Lean has also has calculus induction. You have you have. Oh, so it's the same type I'm, theory. Okay, I'm wrong then. You you, you have wrong. infinite sets. So you, yeah. you have infinite sets. Um, <clears throat> so it must be undecidable, um, essentially. But yeah, you still can automate a lot. I mean. With those negative results, it's always there are instances that you cannot do automatically. And then the question is, do they actually interest, it, um, interest us in real life? And experience shows that a large fragment of problems that we actually want to look at are decidable or after a little bit of massage by human guidance are suddenly moving towards some decidable fragment and you get a lot of automation. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, I know we've taken up more time than we planned, so um, I'll bring this to a close. Are there any final thoughts or questions from anyone before we say thank you to James and, and everyone else has contributed? Any last minute? James, you've actually um, uh, frozen again. Oh, so no, no, I'm just, uh, I'm just standing still. Okay. Uh, right. I think it says any, okay. any, other... any final thoughts from you at all? Anyone? Any questions from anyone? Questions. Okay, there's a question from Bruce um, from Vasu. Um, yeah, go ahead, um, Vasu. You can either right. type it or ask it. I'll put my email. If anyone wants to give me an email, there's my email. And you Fantastic. Can find me on the Twitters for more yep. more interactive theorem provers and general mass rambles. Yep. Fantastic. So um, I'll 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 put this video um, on YouTube. Um, I'll do a little write up um, um, just as a little blog around this. And links to to the slides. Um, and if uh, James, you're if you want people to contact you, um, yeah. I can give them your contact details. Um, the question from Vasu, the last question for today is: Why Isabel Hull doesn't use dependent type theory? Um, I'm out. I, guess I don't know. I've got no <laughs> idea. It's Isabel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, that, that's a discuss, That's a philosophical discussion we can do days on. Uh, historically, I would say depend. I mean, Isabel has been designed and invented in 86, 1986. So it's a pretty old system. Um, and it took certain design decisions. And there are ongoing discussions within the Isabel community. Um, what can systems that use dependent types do that Isabel Hall cannot do with the limited support for dependent types it has? Isabel has something called locales, which provides a subset of dependent type functionality, roughly speaking. And um, yeah, we are always, Isabel community always looks for examples of things they cannot do. And as far as I know, they haven't found anything yet. And of course, you cannot just add dependent types to higher order logic because then it becomes inconsistent. Or at least that is what people believe at the moment. And uh, consistency is the holy grail of uh, the system itself. So you don't want to endanger that. <laughs> um, I will, um, I will, if you joined with uh, meetup.com, I'll put it in the comments, uh, the link to the YouTube. But if you're still here if i can load up my safari i'll i'll, I'll put a link here as well oh, I um promise. <clears throat> i promise the things up let's do that in now yeah uh 
go ahead. Here's the here's the channel, but I will post a, a direct link to the uh, meetup so you get it in your inbox. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone, and thanks James, and thanks everyone who contributed. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Bruce, Brooker, Bruce, um, as well. Um, really, really interesting. Um, as, and I think it was really important to have a session which just helps people who who are new to this world just understand it a little bit. Um, uh, and, and hopefully gives them the confidence to explore more. I know I will, um, even as a non-mathematician, um, there's, there's um, you know, there's, there's, you, you've painted a picture, a map, and I can kind of move back to that map a little bit. So thanks everyone. Um, you've posted some links and I'll, I'll share them out as well. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much everyone for joining in. Cheers. Final word of wisdom, make sure, you, make sure you know the maths well before you formalize, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you, cheers. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.